Liz, how do, how do we say it again? It's Ghislaine Maxwell trial day one ninety nine. That's the gavel, ladies and gentlemen. No gavel. What? I didn't see a gavel. I looked for it again. Oh, God. Oh, God. I can't fucking believe this. I can't fucking believe this. <laughs> this always fucking happens to me. Which is funny because I was actually going through my notes mm-hmm. from when, from the trial, like on the way to the today, to court today. Mm-hmm. And there, one of my last notes was, I saw a gavel. So at one point, yeah, we did see a gavel, but the gavel is now gone. Well, maybe it was like she had one in like a shoulder holster <laughs> for a while, but she just didn't. She didn't draw. Uh, Liz, hello, hello, Brace, hello, everyone. I'm Liz. My name is Brace. We, of course, joined by producer Young Chomsky, and this is True and On Trial Coverage, Final Judgment. Trial Coverage, Final, final Judgment. Um, so, we did the math. Hmm. We just did the math. We found out that it is now day 199 of the trial when you include this little interlude that we've been in, which is almost six months to the day, but not quite, since the verdict came out in the Ghislaine Maxwell case. Yes, and now today, June 28th, she has been sentenced. Yes, Ghislaine Maxwell sentenced to 20 years and, let us not forget, $750,000 in fines. Mm-hmm. Which he did try to wriggle out out of, but we oh can, yes, we can we can get into that. So, Liz, you went to the courthouse today. I did go to the courthouse. Yes, I was there, present with a whole host of old friends of ours and a lot of new faces, mm-hmm. um, including a woman who protested the use of QR code to get in. Did she really? Yes, and refused to divulge her vaccination status, which okay. felt like a throwback. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. Listen, I, you know, I don't care if you're vaccinated or not. All I care about is that you refuse to use QR codes. That's really my main political issue. I think that's that's totally fine. I, I support that. So tell me about it. L- lay, lay out the scene for me. What happened today? Well, before we get into that, I do want to update you mm-hmm. because I did have to go see what's up. At Cafe Lorenzo, just get a little lay of the land. Yes. It's been a minute since we were there. Mm. And it looks about the same. Not much has changed. However, there's a new sandwich board that they got branded Cafe Lorenzo, which I thought was very nice. And it had a little message that I thought was really lovely. And I wrote it down in my notebook for you, Brace. What was it? It said, Cafe Lorenzo presents... New day, new blessings. Three exclamation points. I don't, I don't, I don't understand. I don't really understand it either, but I thought it was a very nice sentiment. And I like that they were trying to spread joy in such a dark basement. Yes. I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've visited once or twice in the interlude. Of course, between the First and Second World War, I'm referring to there. <laughs> and to lay back on the divan there and have that seductress that they call a cafe worker dip sausage links connected by little strands into my mouth as I chomp them bite by bite, oh my God. slurping them with my tongue like the guy from Spawn. I did, I, I, I did eat something. I got a yogurt, but prepackaged. Yeah, mm. If you're at Cafe Lorenzo, hot tip. Always go for the prepackaged. Yeah, Nothing you don't, that they make in house. <laughs> it's not. It's not. Remember that chicken I got? That was funky. Yeah, that was a first date chicken. That never, was, uh, that never was, again. That never was, again. We I say have, definitely not a first day chicken, but I know what you mean. <laughs> All right, so Cafe Lorenzo, fantastic as always. Okay, yeah, fantastic as always. Let's get to the real meat and potatoes of the episode. Uh huh. <laughs> On that gourmand tip, um. So, yeah, very busy. A lot of people, a lot of new faces. I got to say, COVID rules out. So we're all packed in like sardines. You're French shoulder, kissing. Shoulder to shoulder. Everyone's making out. It's mm-hmm. like, you know, a total 
just, you know, free for all. That's, all, that's it, a, that, that was missing when we were there. The orgiastic quality <laughs> to the Thurgood Marshall courthouse was just gone. Yes, that flavor in, in New York's in changed. true Thurgood, Thurgood. Remember we didn't, I feel like we had a hard time saying that before. It's a fucked up name. <laughs> um, no, but there was a lot of, uh, it seemed to be a lot of law students or legal aides, clerks, et cetera, types, mm-hmm. um, because they all have phones. And so you knew that they were like, kind of like let in. Yeah. Um, and a lot of press that we haven't seen in a long time. And, you know, got to say hello to some old faces, which was nice. Okay. Yes. But the proceedings started around 11 a.m., mm-hmm. which I appreciated as well. And, um, Ghislaine shuffled in gray prison garb, mm-hmm. little kind of like tissue white long sleeve underneath, um, hair, let's say dome-like, kind mm-hmm. of helmet, helmet-esque, um, little Tom Brady cut, but like, you know, the helmet style, um, and shackled. In chains. She's in chains. In chains. You could hear it. Clink, 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 clink. Wow. Clink. Yeah. And so, like, you know, her gait was sort of, you know, um, very Staggered. abrupt. Yeah. Yes. Interesting um, they put a Jew in chains within six months of Hanukkah. <laughs> yeah. Jacob Marley asked, look, I'm bitch. We're Marley and Marley. Uh, she was all clanking around up in there, but <laughs> mm-hmm. she was for the most part, not, you know, the body language, Yeah, obviously as a, um, you know, studying body language expert, soon to be expert. Uh, she really wasn't, you know, um, effusive. I'll say she was really like quiet, demure, like really loving that Fiji water, you know, as always. It was really like bringing all this, all these memories back from the trial, you know. I mean, can you imagine after being in in Gowanus Jail, drinking the tap mm. water there, how delicious a nice was rectangular bottle of Fiji <laughs> must feel? <laughs> yeah, um, but you know, the probably the biggest surprise of the day, which I think the whole thing took about four hours um, mm-hmm. in Toto, which was much longer than I anticipated. I'll just say. Um, uh, the biggest surprise was that Ghislaine herself made a statement, which was shocking. Yes, because as listeners of our trial coverage will know, there was a lot of like, I mean, we never really actually thought she was going to speak in her own defense. It would Mm -hmm. have probably been a pretty bad move because she would have been cross-examined. Um, but... She didn't say a word during the entire trial, except for to answer a few questions, I believe, at the beginning and at the end. Yeah. Um, and so this was actually her first sustained vocalization. Yeah, and it was long. Um, I, it, I Look, I'm just going to say, silkiest voice I've ever heard. You're joking, really? I'm not joking. It was like... That it was like very soft, and I understood immediately what the the, the quality that Gillian has that that many victims have spoken about, which is that she has this sort of like soft, manipulative, mm-hmm. um, kind of like calm, but uh, you can tell there's like it's not totally genuine quality. Yeah. It's like yeah. there's some kind of affect to it that is like it feels like it's almost almost nice but not it's not at all there's a darkness but it was like it was silky smooth um just totally eloquent perfect british english of course and you know it kind of like took me aback i was like i don't know it felt it it was it was it was pretty shocking yeah i mean she didn't she didn't seem to speak for very long i've read the speech now her her family has published it um but what did what was your sort of reaction? Or were you sort of like, I mean, obviously I would have been shocked that she had spoken because I mean, while it makes sense, her lawyers definitely seemed to try to keep her off the stand the whole time. Uh, I mean, what do you have any takeaways from it? Well, what my one for my first takeaway was I wonder if she actually would have been good on the stand because yes. she was very 
you know, eloquent and whatever uh, put together. And there's just something, you know, us Americans are such dumb yokels that we hear the British accent and we automatically are like, this is a very smart, reasonable yes. person, no matter what. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, Not all British accents, but I know what you mean. <laughs> no, that like high educated, posh British yes. voice, very posh. Um, my second main takeaway I will say is that she sort of was like, it felt like she was really faking her contriteness that yes. she, um, you know, was kind of saying these right, these cr- things that she was supposed to say. She really was like, you know, I, I hope that the, I'm, I don't have the quote right in front of me, but uh, basically to the, you know, to the effect of, I hope that the girls get closure that this trial brings them, you know, so they can kind of move on with this chapter from their life. Like there was a little bit of distance there yeah. that she was trying to say. And then she made a kind of like dramatic pause at one point and then said, you know, um, I meeting Jeffrey Epstein is the biggest regret of my life or something to that effect. And that, I mean, I can kind of believe considering, you know, she is mm-hmm. now being sentenced to jail for, you know, her crimes that she committed alongside with Jeffrey Epstein as Jeffrey Epstein's second in command, by the way, to quote Judge Allison Nathan. Interesting. So I, yeah, I, I, you know, her speech, I I have reread it a few times since her family published it about an hour ago. And it's interesting that she really, you know, when people are like, they do something wrong to you or I'll speak, I'll use I statements here. A lot of times when I've done something wrong to other people, but I don't feel bad about it or I'm trying not to take responsibility, but I'm still trying to do like an apology. You know Mm. what I mean? Mm. You say stuff like, I acknowledge their suffering and empathize deeply with all the victims in this case. I also acknowledge that I have been convicted of helping Jeffrey Epstein commit these crimes. And so it's like, she's basically saying that like, I know that you're hurting and I get that. But she doesn't say, I hurt you, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Yes. And that was, I mean, that was clear as day to anyone in the room. Um, Mm -hmm. She went on. I mean, she says to, I've had plenty of time to think having spent two years in solitary confinement, just like really to like, let you know, she's been in solitary confinement. She's in all the notes. Yep. You know, I believe that Jeffrey Epstein was a manipulative, cunning, and controlling man who lived a profoundly compartmentalized life and fooled all those in his orbit, clearly it, trying to say herself as well, right? Yeah. Um, and, I, I, you know, I got to say for, uh, to give her credit, Allison Nathan, uh, the judge, like, didn't buy any of that. And when she was getting to the sentencing, she made a point to really say, you know, you said that, you know, you hope that this brings them closure. You hope that they can like move on. I'm sorry for the pain that you feel. That's always such a, that's such a like, yeah. And now I sound like one of those kind of like viral uh, Twitter, like girl tweets. That's always like, you know, th- dear men who don't go to therapy, like this is not how you apologize or yeah, whatever. Yeah, but like yeah. for real, that's like not a good apology. <laughs> That's the, I'm sorry that you feel the way that you do. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like that's, apology. That, that's hella crazy. And I'm sorry that you're mentally ill, but like <laughs> I acknowledge that and I acknowledge your suffering. I hope my conviction along with my harsh incar- incarceration brings mm-hmm. you closure. And what's so funny is that when I read that out loud, it sounds so fucking passive aggressive. and So like, passive aggressive. And, and it is, it absolutely is. But I'm telling you, in the like silky smooth posh voice that Ghislaine has, there's a way that she's able to twist it. So it does actually sound almost like contrite and like she's trying to actually, you know, empathize with them and, 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 and sort of like, you know, take responsibility in some respect. But Alice Nathan had like, she was just, she flat out said like, you have not taken responsibility. And for that reason, you know, I'm, I, you know, I feel okay or whatever to, you know, go above the sentencing guidelines, which we can get into, um, to sentence you to a, you know, longer 
prison sentence. Yes, and she is, I want to be clear here, she is getting sent to the Orange is the New Black prison in Danbury, <laughs> Connecticut. On TV, I wish. Yes, it is a minimum security prison. So well, we don't I, know if, I she's being sent, if she is being sent there, but we do know that that was the recommendation. Yeah, that was the recommendation at least, yeah. Um, which is cool because I, I mean, I, I hit that place up all the time. I do a lot of mutual aid for like, <laughs> you know, some of the cooler chicks in there. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it seems like Nathan was really not having her excuse about money too. You know, I saw it reported that, uh, that her lawyers were basically saying that she didn't get any Epstein's money you know, in reference to the $10 million that, that judge, uh, judge Nathan says that, that Ghislaine got. And Nathan kind of goes back in and interrupts and it's like, actually, it looks like she did get the money. You're just talking about the will money. This is money from something else. Um, yeah, they were trying to kind of like scoot around some of that. It was a little confusing. Um, and it seemed to be that part of that there's a bunch of financial statements alongside some of the documents that were filed. Mm-hmm. Um, but they are not public information. And so we do not have access to that. But it does sound like, you know, yeah, definitely trying to scoot around some of the financial requirements. So what were the victim statements like? (sighs) These were pretty tough. I can imagine. We heard from four victims in person and then um, one victim via their lawyer, Virginia Roberts. Mm -hmm. Um, A statement from her was read by her lawyer. Um, we heard from Annie Farmer first, who, of course, also wa- uh, testified in the trial. Um, we heard from Kate, who also testified in the trial. That's a pseudonym that she went under, Kate. Uh, Sarah Ransome, who was present for uh, a lot of the trial, but was not part of the the case, like wasn't a victim in the case. Um, mm-hmm. And then we heard from... Um, Elizabeth Stein, who came forward at the end of the trial, I believe like maybe one of the last days of the trial came forward to tell her story. And I had never heard the details of it. Mm -hmm. Um, She actually, I mean, this is, this is kind of crazy. She was present for almost every day of the trial. And I remember seeing her there and I, I'm you and I have both spoken to her we did not know that she was a victim of Jeffrey Epstein and Gilway Maxwell's. Uh, she, that was never, she didn't ever disclose that. She just said that she was coming up from Philly. I remember that. Yeah. Every day for the trial. And she mentioned that during her statement to the court um, and kind of went through her story. Uh, you know, each and every one of these women were incredibly moving and, you know, at different points in their stories or in their statements, rather, like, I mean, broke down, you know? Yeah. A lot of them faced Ghislaine directly, addressed her directly. Um, Ghislaine, for her part, you know, really didn't look at any of the girls, which I I think is, you know, not surprising. Um, She really, like, looked away. She was kind of, like, looking directly into a corner (laughs) for some of it or towards her lawyer, Christian Everdell, um, which made it very kind of like awkward. Obviously, I mean, there's like, you know, this girl, like this woman telling these like harrowing stories on the verge of tears. And then, you know, a foot away, Ghislaine Maxwell is sitting there just not looking at her. I mean, Mm -hmm. it was just, you know, a really kind of like tough scene. Now, Elizabeth Stein says that she met Ghislaine um, at Bendel's, actually. She was working as a young girl um, at Bendel's uh, while she was at FIT. What's Bendel's? Oh, Henry Bendel's. It's a, or Henri Bendel's. It's a Upper East Side department store. It's one of the Bendel's, Barney's, RIP, Bergdorf's, Blue Mace. Wow, RIP sounds a little. <laughs> um. Gothic. Bendel's is the one with the chocolate stripes. So, oh, which weirdly enough, actually, the woman mm-hmm. sitting in front of me had a bag from Bendel's under her seat. Interesting. Which felt like a very weird little cosmic gift. Synchronicity. Yeah. Um, 
So she said that she was working at Bendel's. Ghislaine came in. The girl who usually helped Ghislaine wasn't there. And so she helped Ghislaine. Um, she immediately started talking with her and, you know, gabbing about in that way that we've heard from so many women like Ghislaine would talk to these girls mm -hmm. when she was trying to kind of, group, you know, approach them to eventually groom them for Epstein. Um, she, Ghislaine mentions to Elizabeth that, um, you know, she says, oh, my boss is very close friends with the owner of Bendel's who at the time Bendel's was owned by a little company called the limited AKA mm. Les Wexner. And she said, you know, I can intro you to, to Epstein, you know, um, maybe we can get you a better job. That kind of situation unfolded. Um, she said that when she went to go uh, meet Ghislaine, she was like, I don't know. It was like a little unclear. She was delivering clothes that Ghislaine had just bought from Bendel's to a hotel that Ghislaine was at. Um, she approached her in the hotel bar. Epstein was there. It kind of went from there. And um, it was that night that the first like sexual assault happened. She said it was, uh, you know, from that point on that the relationship sort of, uh, I, I mean, I don't want to say developed, but just kind of grew from there. Uh, it wasn't the first time that Epstein and Ghislaine assaulted her. And they ended up uh, getting her a new job position at Bendel's, which she felt uncomfortable with because she knew, and I think this was a quote from her, that like what the the modus operandi was, was that they were going to give a gift or a favor and demand sex in return. Yeah. She says she quit and she moved. She, she ended up working at Bloomingdale's after she finished her degree at FIT and that Ghislaine found her there afterwards. And um, it was at that point that she sort of, after a lot of I, it, what sounds like kind of pleading and prodding that she finally acquiesced and they ended up spending more time with Ghislaine and Epstein, even though she felt uncomfortable, obviously um, went and spent time in Florida for that reason. She got fired from Bloomingdale's. She mm -hmm. said that she was trafficked to friends of Ghislaine and Jeffrey's. Um, she said things happened that were so traumatizing. I can't even speak of them. And I, you know, her voice is shaking. We've never heard from her, um, up until this moment. It was, um, you know, it was, it was quite shocking. It's been some time since we've, you know, just to, to kind of like paint a picture, you know, it's been six months since you or I have been in this like courtroom, yeah. you know, and heard from these girls. And it was kind of like, we're right back here. Now Ghislaine is hearing from them. This girl hasn't had her, you know, this woman hasn't had her moment yet. And she finally, you know, is finally getting a chance to speak to her directly. And it was just, it was, um, it was really overwhelming. Yeah. I mean, during the trial we heard, I mean, there were several days where we heard really intense testimony. Yeah, absolutely. You know? And you know, it's one thing to hear to hear this or to 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 read the stuff and to you know to have knowledge of it, but it's another thing to hear it actually from the mouths of the victims and and to sort of be able to witness the actual emotion in their faces and their voices, you know, while they're giving this kind of testimony and while they're telling their stories. It can be it can be um, you know an intense experience, obviously for the listener, but it can be a really intense and traumatizing experience for the victims. Yeah. And for Elizabeth, I mean, she, you know, she said that, you know, after these, the, this time with, with Jeffrey and Ghislaine, that she just had, um, one of many, uh, emotional and mental breakdowns. And from there she was, you know, hospitalized. She was in and out of hospitals. She had physical symptoms. Her trauma was like manifesting physical symptoms. Mm -hmm. She was, um, you know, like, doctors couldn't really figure out what was wrong with her. Then she was finally diagnosed with this rare kind of pain disorder. Um, and there's, you know, she said to the court, she's like, and finally, like I knew I wasn't crazy. I was hurt. Yeah. And it was, you know, she says this was, this came 25 years after I first met them. Like I lost my entire life to these people and I'm like begging the court to take that into account and send her away for her life because she has had her life and it's time that I've had mine. 
Yeah, wow. Well, speaking of that, um, you know, Ghislaine got 20 years. You know, uh, she is what? She's 60 years old? Yes. Bobby made a point. Bobby, you know, I got to say, Bobby was in her summer shoes, not cowboy boots. You know, I'm always going to make a note of this, but some sort of like pointy, my girls will know, J. Pliner style, uh, like almost, I want to say like Indian inspired um, slipper, like a leather slipper. I'm going to be honest with you here. Mm. Don't know what most of those words meant. Okay. What I'm picturing here is a leather sort of like, uh, who's the lady who loses the shoe in like the myth? Cinderella? Cinderella shoe. Like a no, leather that's Cinderella shoe. Let me, let me finish. A leather Cinderella type shoe, but with one large oversized like knotted leather thong between her big toe and her index toe on both, but also no back like sarapas. Actually, I don't know what a sarapa is. Wait, like a flip flop? Yeah, but like a princess style, like, but also sort of southwestern flip flip flop. Like that the, sounds very weird, but also not at all close to what she was wearing. But mm -hmm, I think she was wearing that. But okay, I like your energy, and so mm -hmm. I think that we should we should act as if she was wearing those. Yeah, she was also wearing she was also wearing um, a uh, poncho. As well. <laughs> no, she was wearing. She had her high collared white shirt on. Mm -hmm. Um, you know her swoosh of lavender, cool lavender blonde hair. Um, yeah, she was she was real fiery today. Bobby was there. Uh, like I mentioned, Christian Everdell was there. Classic. No, Pagliacci. He has unfortunately been executed, actually, <laughs> which was really yeah. tough for me to hear. But you know what? Happens to basically every Italian. Yeah. No Pagliacci, no Laura Menninger. So just mm -hmm. the two of them. Um, but yeah, uh, Bobby was real fired up. She was, she came out afterwards to give a little press conference and she kind of like, you know, saunters over. Everyone's like huddled around. And I got to mm -hmm. say, these YouTube guys have got to cool it. The Everyone is like trying to get their little smartphones mm -hmm. up in the grill of Bobby Sternheim. So they're all surrounding her, right? So yeah. you got, she's facing directly the cameras and the microphones, right? Okay, that's Classico style. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Then we've got the riffraff, social media vultures, present company included uh you know surrounding her on either side but these like jokers next to me left and right jokers on the left of me jokers on the right got their arms their their long ass stretch armstrong arms out holding their smartphones like excuse me getting these videos it's like betty what is this video for first of all you're not watching this later Second of all, someone's getting it on the big camera. Mm -hmm. What are you uploading it to YouTube? No one watches your YouTube. No one cares. My thing is too, Liz is, I mean, to me, she's tall, but Liz is 4'1". <laughs> and if you have an arm in front, don't put your arm in front of a woman's face unless you say pardon my reach, in which case you can do it basically for as long this as This guy with a mustache? Hitler? <laughs> <laughs> no, but he, no, he was like very rumpled in what would have usually been kind of charming but wasn't because he like left out of, I don't know, behind me and was like, oh, and like put his arm out with a stupid fucking iPhone, like get trying to like, oh, got to get Bobby like from the side. It's like, it's, I can see what you're recording. It's a horrible video. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you're in my face. I can't hear what she's saying. It's like, who is this for? No one's buying it. And no one's watching your YouTube. Get your shit out of my face. Yeah. Get your shit out of Liz's face. This is this. Next time we go to the courthouse, I'm bringing a gun. <laughs> um, but yes, so Bobby, so she comes, she comes out, everyone's surrounding her, and she has a little speech. She's reading off of a piece of paper, which I got to say. Unprofessional. 
it's a little, you know, it's kind of ruining the moment. Mm -hmm. You want to like Darrow the shit up. You can't use, he didn't have a paper. He didn't have cue cards. Clarence Darrow couldn't read. (laughs) She, yeah. So I didn't like that, but she, you know, she immediately was like, you know, we have been, you know, we have been very, uh, respectful of the court. Mm. We have, you know, kept silent on a lot of things that have happened that you don't know about, which didn't say, um, but we shall be silent no longer. Like, you know, they're filing appeals. They're appealing everything. They think it's a travesty, blah, 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 blah. And she did mention something very interesting where she was like, you know, if you want a story, if you need a little, like, you know, if you need to go follow the lead somewhere, check out the BOP, the Bureau of Prisons, because something funny is going on there. Well, that's very interesting because in the past few days, as we reported in our last episode, Ghislaine Maxwell has been remanded to the loony bin in Mm. the jail. Basically, they put her on suicide watch. Yes. Or suey dubs, as they call it, uh, in New York. They know they do. They do. I learned that in the streets. And... um, she has been placed on suicide watch. She is describing both vague and specific threats against her life. Uh, it seems like maybe intimating some of them could be coming from prison officials or bureau of prison officials. Some of them could be coming from fellow inmates. Um, you know, it's not uncommon for uh, people in jail to be put in suicide watch before they're handed down their sentence. Mm. Um, so, you know, I'm not reading too much into it. You know, I, I posted a, I posted a, or. Uh, one of my many employees and friends, uh, same thing to me, actually, we're all family, posted on Twitter uh, the article saying that she's on suicide watch. And all these people are like, RIP, she's going to die in the next few days. I don't, obviously, I don't think they're about to kill her before she gets sentenced. You know what I mean? That's a little ridiculous. Um, but I do think that uh, it, I would, I would like someday to know exactly what went down with Ghislaine in jail because I do think that they definitely singled her out in many, many, many ways because of whatever happened to Jeffrey Epstein, Mm -hmm. um, his, let's say, alleged suicide, mysterious death in jail. Um, And, you know, I, 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 you know, mea culpa, I made the prediction that they would um, be able to make her retarded somehow before the trial, which I was wrong about. Um, Were you though? I don't know. Give me, I need to talk to her because I can, I can figure it out. That's got me out of a lot of trouble before. Um, some say I have the gift, but like it's like The Shining from the the movie The Shining. You know what though, Alice and Nathan brought this up. Not uh-huh. that second point of yours, but the first one. <laughs> She's like, Grace has the Shining <laughs> gift. No, she didn't. None of this. She didn't bring up any of that. But she did bring up that actually Ghislaine had probably better treatment because of her special status than other inmates. Mm-hmm. Um, because also because it was during COVID, right? And so she, Alice and Nathan, brought that up because she was trying to refute some of what the defense was arguing for yeah. for saying that you know she was getting all this terrible treatment. Um, and she and Alice and Nathan was like, actually, you know, you being away from all of these inmates during COVID, you actually probably got a better deal than a lot of them. You know, a lot of the normal guys. Yeah, I mean, listen, the second they let her out of fucking, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if I would call it solitary, but they let her out of, they they let her into gen pop. Um, She immediately is like, people are trying to kill me. Yeah. And so, I don't know. I mean, who knows? The thing is, for for all of you out there, for anybody who out there isn't a bar head, um, which is like a jail fan enthusiast, uh, prison's actually usually a lot better than jail in many ways because there's more stuff to do. You have a little bit more, I don't know if I would call it freedom, but depending on the prison, of course, like there activities. Is, there's more activities. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, you can start raising Presa Canaris dogs. Um, sure. There's a lot there's of stuff. There's always you can Islam. Do. There's all, oh my, dude, it's fucking Ghislaine. <laughs> I don't even, I don't want to think about it because I would, that would be incredible. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, you can also write a book, uh, you know, after maybe you try to do a coup and maybe the book gets really popular and then now people get mad at you when you're clearly reading it on the bus or something like that. Um, 
you know, it, there's a there's a lot more to do in prison. So who knows how she'll be doing then? I, what I'm curious is remember that guy at the end of the trial, the white haired gentleman, very tall from I think it was ABC or NBC, one of the BCs. Yeah, I didn't see him there today. He sprinted over to her and was actually able to talk to her, unlike basically anybody else during the entirety of the trial. The where the scuttlebutt was that he was setting up an interview, which has clearly not manifested itself. Although, again, six months maybe they're making a documentary or something. Um, but uh, I do wonder what her experience in prison is going to be like. And it does seem like she is about to appeal as well. Obviously, she's going to appeal. Um, oh, yeah. They've got this all ready to go. And speaking of the appeal, mm-hmm. old favorite, who I think will be featured heavily in the appeals process. Oh, yeah. Juror Scotty David, mm-hmm. the erstwhile juror, <laughs> the rogue juror. Who, if uh, listeners don't remember, went after the the verdict went immediately to the press, and not just the press, all press, any press, all any, of them. all the press he could get. Scotty David, all over it. Yeah, call him a bench because he was press in. He um, did that one. That one made sense, right? Let me know if that one. I made like sense it in the when you do them, even when they don't. I, it's okay. better when they don't make sense because you no. Know, also, it shows how creative and quick you are. Check this out. Call him a little devilish character who hangs out by a magician because he was an imp press. Okay, that didn't. That one, that one made was, sense, but it just not in this just, context. You always got to go with the first one. You're always great. First go. Yeah. Second go. I, I, yeah. I don't have a good refractory period. So um, he was there. You know, what's funny is he was there. Jacob, the first thing Jacob texts me after he gets out. Friend of like, the pod, Jacob. Friend of the pod. Yeah. Jacob Champsian. I'm not going to try. I can never that. say it. You know what? It sounds like it's it's one of those. That's it's pronounced something like that. When I saw him, by the way, he said, where's your better half? Oh, he Which knows I we're thought- married. <laughs> I thought that was very cute. Oh my god! Well, anyways, he texts me. He's like Scotty David of the trial in a fucking uh, camouflage hoodie. Yes. So, Liz, he wore a camo hoodie to the trial. Yes. Now it feels very Scotty David to think that literal camouflage would camouflage you. Was it like urban camo, where it's like blue and purple, or was it like <laughs> no? Camo, it was like camo. camo camo. Oh my god! Real tree. Yeah. He was trying to keep a low prof. Mm-hmm. And yet everyone was like, hey, isn't that Scotty David? Because it was Scotty David. Everyone knew. Not only were you in like all the papers and the tabloids being like, I'm the juror. We all covered the trial. You were on the jury. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's true. We saw you. At- yes. Yeah. I, I, it's I, Scotty David. God love him. You know, God it's funny. Bless him. It's funny because there was a lot, and I get this. There was a lot of people being like, well, maybe this was like a setup. But you, you spend two seconds looking at Scotty David. He, the man does not seem, I'm going to say this in the most charitable way I can. Mm. If that guy's a patsy, he is the patsiest patsy that there <laughs> ever was. He's because, like the second tier pat. He's a patsy of a yeah. patsy. And and frankly, I mean, so far the the Maxwell team's um, legal maneuverings involving Monsieur David uh, have not gone very well. Um, I know. I wonder if that's because they're saving the big guns for the next go, or they knew they weren't going to get anywhere with Allison Nathan. I got to mm-hmm. say, it does seem a bit crazy. <laughs> the yeah. whole thing. Here's hoping it obviously. Here's hoping that it doesn't go anywhere. Yeah. Um. But I don't know. Yeah, Nathan did not like Maxwell, but maybe the next judge will be... You know, it's interesting because mm-hmm. there was a whole... You know, we talked about it on the last episode. The you know, the defense was arguing for the 2003 sentencing guidelines. Yes. And the prosecution was arguing for the 2004 sentencing guidelines. This hinged on whether or not the abuse took place in November and December of 2004 mm-hmm. and it specifically had to do with Carol the with Carolyn it was that was the charge um and over and over again Allison Nathan basically was giving <laughs> the government opportunity she was like yes but do you have evidence any other evidence or any new <laughs> evidence showing that November and December of 2004 the conspiracy was happening at that time 
And the government, re the only thing they could produce was memo pads that had not specific dates, but like early November dates at the top and later November dates at the bottom and uh -huh. later December dates, but no specific date with Carolyn's name. And it was so funny because Alice and Nathan was like trying to give the government like every opportunity to, mm -hmm. to help them, like <laughs> to help them out basically and signaling like my hands are tied. You're not giving me anything. And so she did agree with the defense that the 2003 sentencing guidelines had to stand. Um, and that they, you know, that she had to kind of like use those as she had to kind of, you know, I don't know what agree with them or. Yeah. Yeah. They had to know. use those as the guideline. Yeah. Which, you know, she ended up going over those guidelines, which she can do. And she had, she explained all those reasons. Um, but it was interesting because I, I, you know, was watching this whole exchange and I just immediately remembered, I was just like, fuck the government's case was so fucking bad. Awful. And it gets lost, you know, and I kind of had forgotten just how many, how difficult this case was for them to put together and communicate how complicated the charges were and how layered it was and how, um, you know, it, how close it felt at so many times of, uh, to, 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 to falling apart. And this was like yet another moment where I was just like, oh fuck. And yeah. then, you know, 20 years, baby. She'll get out. 20 years. 80, 80 years old. Mm-hmm. Which, I gotta be honest, not a life sentence. Not I a mean, life sentence. Still feels like that old bag could keep kicking for a long time after that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, hell, we'll probably still be doing the pod by then. <laughs> we can go to her parole hearings. What if she's oh out in 10 for good behavior? Could you imagine? We do, like, Ghislaine trial episode... 3,000, it wouldn't be 3,000, it'd be like 34,862. Yeah. We're all bald somehow. I wouldn't be bald. Why would I, I be know. bald? I don't know. Microplastics? It's and it's and such? No. Gin ginkgo so. biloba deficiency? What? Not enough Im imp presses? <laughs> So, I mean, we really went over this, I believe, on the last final episode of our trial coverage um, and throughout the trial as well. Uh, but it bears repeating that, uh, that of course, Ghislaine Maxwell is, is going to be doing time, hard time, uh, for her role in the Jeffrey Epstein, Ghislaine Maxwell, trafficking cabal. Um but one thing that's missing, or one of the many things that's missing, or a plurality of things that are missing, uh, are, uh, are any actual people who really participated in this stuff. Mm. Um, you know, for, from, from what you could glean, if you know nothing about this except directly only, actually, no, even if you listen in court, you would, you would know that there was other people involved. But, um, you know, it really seems like the, the case is like Ghislaine Maxwell trafficked these girls to Jeffrey Epstein, and that's it. Nobody else had any involvement. Case closed. Put her away. Throw away the key. Look at we got justice. But that's not the case. No. Traffic to who? Exactly. <laughs> I mean, there is a whole host of people out there. World leaders, politicians. That's kind of the same, same thing. Well, some of those politicians aren't world leaders. Like, yeah, because they're bad politicians. Like New Mexico, you know. Um, celebrities, scientists, uh, you know, the list goes on. I, and, and, you know, you see some little flare ups of this stuff, Bill Gates, um, you know, getting his divorce basically sped through by his wife using that stuff as an excuse. Um, <laughs> Jean-Luc Brunel dying mysteriously in prison with almost no follow up, no idea what really happened there. Um, but really it's like, this has been, you know, for as, as big a deal as this case was very managed and, and it was kind of kept as small as it could possibly be kept for being such a large operation. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I think that's definitely true. And I think that there are a lot of things with this case that we're never going to get any kind of real answers about or any kind of real closure on. But I think that 
for the four women who spoke today, the four victims who were part of this case, um, and for the hundreds, if not thousands of women who were abused and trafficked by Ghislaine Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein, like to them, it isn't a huge conspiracy with a bunch of like links to put together. I mean, it is, but also that's not how it relates to them because to them, it's just, you know, getting some modicum of justice mm-hmm. for what the like horrific abuse and trauma that they've endured. Yeah. Yeah. And absolutely. I think that if anything, at least having that, you know, I think is something that everyone can understand. Well said Liz. And uh, you know what you're going to say really good right now? My name is Liz. My name is Brace. We are of course joined by producer Young Chomsky. And the podcast was called True and On. <laughs> we'll see you next time. Bye bye. Jeffrey Epstein. Jeffrey Epstein.